Okay, the reading for this week is uh, Ishikawa Jun's debut work called Kajing, uh, translated by me as the fair one. It's, uh, my translation is included in my forthcoming uh, tome, and I have a chapter about the, that explores and uh, analyzes the work in that book. I'll put links to that below. Uh, the book should come out hopefully next year. Um, this is his debut work, written in 1935, May 1935 issue of the major literary journal Saku Hing. Although Ishikawa had already published numerous fictional etudes, as he called them, or shusaka, translations of French literature and essays of literary criticism, this is the work that had lo has long been regarded by Japanese critics as marking his debut as a writer. So his sho shoujo saku, it's often referred to as. The work was immediately praised by the prominent novelist Maki no Shinichi, whose Zeron we read the other day in class, you'll remember, who died young at, uh, just a year after this work was published whose favorable review put Ishikawa on the radar of Japanese bundang, or literary establishment. Two years later, Ishikawa would win the fourth annual Akutagawa Show, Akutagawa Prize, for his first full-length novel, Fugeng, or the Bosatsu, 1936. As I argue in Chapter 3 of my tone, Kajin is both an I-novel and an anti-novel, or I-novel parody, that undermines the basic, te basic tenets of autobiographical realism through the conspicuous use of four types of literary literary mediation, which I call deep mediation, surface re mediation, reflexive mediation, and figural mediation. The work's first-person narrator, a kind of mitate, you remember this word from our uh, essay on the Edo, uh, the thought patterns of the people of Edo, a kind of mitate, or parody, or eccentric, uh, a parody of the neo eccentric neo-Daoist poets of Chinese antiquity, such as Ran Zhi, who was mentioned in the poem, uh, this narrator longs to escape the confines of his insular world and submerge himself into something external. And the story he relates is about his various unsuccessful attempts to accomplish this. Despite his repeated attempts to locate this unspecified, obscure, and elusive object, represented by the work's central metaphor of the fair one, or the kajing, or jia leng in Chinese, he is consistently rebuffed, humiliated, and eventually reduced to a wild beast, as he puts it, ikko no yajiu. The story ends with him stuck within the confines of self and completely in the grip of his possessor, as he calls him, namely the Greek demigod Pan. The work introduced the narrative structure that would characterize Ishikawa's early fiction, and not namely an unnamed first-person narrator who is struggling, a struggling artist of some mitia, aspires to create an alternative world through his art, but is prevented from doing so by some interloping force beyond his control. This force then, <clears throat> then becomes the main focus of the narrator's attention and by extension the main subject of the worst. So we see this structure, narrative structure, in uh, Maru's, Maru's no Uta and many of the other uh, famous works from Ishikawa's early period. Here, the disruptive force takes the form of the narrator's acute self-consciousness, or jishiki as we say in Japanese, and irrepressible sexual desire represented by this uh, pan, uh, Greek demigod who uh, supposedly possesses him. Ironically, it is precisely his inability to overcome this uh, possessing force of Pan that enables him to write the work we are reading. Okay, that's the introductory blurb, and just briefly some things to consider as we read. Um, Pan, obviously you need to look into Pan, is of course the Greek god of instincts and sexual desire. In Greek mythology, Pan is the god of shepherds and flocks, of mountain wilds, of hunting and rustic music, as well as the companion of nymphs. Nympholepsy is another word that's used in this story. He uses the katakai word nympholepsy, nympholepsy, or something like that. Uh, nympholepsy is a state of rapture supposed to be inspired by nymphs, hence an ecstasy or frenzy of emotion, especially inspired by something unattainable. So this notion of uh, reaching for something that which is unattainable is a very important uh, theme in the po poetry of classical China, uh, in the poetry of Duan Zhi especially, who is referenced in this work, and it's a major theme of this work as well. Kukyo, or emptiness, is uh, in Sanskrit, sunyata, of course, is the major concept or notion in uh, Buddhism, is central to this work as well. It relates to the idea that the self or ego is an empty void, and this is a sort of fact about himself that he discovers in the process of his story, that he himself is simply an empty void inside. This idea is also central to many modern contemporary philosophers' conception of the individual or the subject style. So this idea of the emptiness at the center of the human subject becomes a very important idea in, uh, um, in structuralism and post-structuralism and so forth in the post-war period. Lao Tzu is mentioned in the work, we want to make a note of that. Asisi stigmata, 
appear, St. Francis of Assisi, and many, many other cultural allusions and references appear in this work. Some questions to consider as you read. I have ten or so questions here. Uh, discuss the narrative style of the work. Is this an example of a self-conscious narrator? Give examples. Number two, Watashi, or the I, I narrator, Watashi, begins his narrative by, by describing his search for the navel, or the hesel. Describe this episode. Is the navel, or the omphalos, as I translated at, at, uh, as in a few instances, is this a metaphor for something? What is he trying to locate by uh, searching for this omphalos? If so, what? Number three, describe these two female characters in the work, Yura and Misa, who are sisters. Uh, what is their relation, vi relationship vis-a-vis -vis Watashi? Are they archetypes or symbolic representations of something? If so, what do they represent? Number four, discuss Watashi's disappearing act. So at some point he decides that he wants to disappear from this universe altogether. What is he trying to attain by disappearing? Why? Why does he eventually attempt suicide? Number five, what are the dual aspects of Watashi's personality or nature? Discuss these two uh, sort of opposing forces that uh, vie for uh, dominion over his soul or over his uh, ego or whatever. Number six, how is this work an example of a quest story? What is the narrator searching for? So, Tankyu Monogata, you see in Japanese, the quest story. How is this an example of a quest story? What is he searching for? And to give you a hint, the object that he's searching for changes throughout the story. So keep that in mind and make a list of all these uh, objects of his desire that shift throughout the story. Number seven, how does the motif of Pan, the Greek demigod, fit into the story? Number eight, discuss the significance of the fuyo, or the white hibiscus, that appears at uh, in the middle of the work. And also the poem that Watashi composes after seeing this fuyo, that inspires him to write a poem. Number nine, the story ends with Watashi's confession that he suffers from, as he puts it, a condition known as nymphalepsy. What is nymphalepsy? What are its symptoms? How does he suffer from this, uh, this condition? Number 10, how is Watashi a possessed narrator or character? What is he possessed by? And I think he's possessed by two things that kind of conflict in the work. Uh, Pan, on the one hand, and also by this sort of nothingness, or this Buddhist idea of sunyata, emptiness. How does this possession relate to his act of writing his uh, debut work, writing the story? And there is some overlap between the author himself, Ishikawa Jun, and the narrator in this story. Keep that in mind. Number 11, what are the main themes of the work? Uh, open and in question, you can give me your interpretation of that. Number 12, identify any uh, <laughs> inaccuracies, flaws, or awkward phrasing in my translation. Uh, I'll give you a hint, there are none. <laughs> and that's the end of it. Make it zip, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and now we will move to the work. And before I we begin, I just want to say... There's a very important, or very uh, sort of salient line that's um, from Max Horkheimer's The Critique of Instrumental Reason. Which Max Horkheimer, of course, is the uh, philosopher from Germany associated with the Frankfurt School. And after the war, he wrote this work, a very important work, called The Critique of Instrumental Reason. And in that, he makes a very um, important point that can be applied to Japanese literature of this period as well, of mainly, namely the 1920s, 30s. And he says, even more than philosophy, art, since the 1920s, has made the nothingness, or the sunyata, as we say in Japanese, or in Sanskrit, the nothingness, or the emptiness of the individual, its main theme, both in form and in content. So keep that quotation by Horkheimer in mind as we read this story. Okay, now I shall turn the microphone over to my assistant, Nicole, who will read, as always, uh, both in dramatic fashion and mellifluous uh, fashion, the story in the, uh, my translation, and here you go. I... no, wait, let me start again. I had hoped to start this off with the description of a certain old woman, but the only thing that comes to me now as I press my pen to the page are the stagnant waters of this eye, this watashi, that gush forth onto the page as if the tip of my pen were a floodgate. And while this is no doubt the result of my total self-absorption, it also bespeaks the important stupor to which I have already in this first sentence stunk, and the sheer torpor that includes me from depicting the external things of this world. At any rate, I, a useless drifter, perched atop a hill dressed in the rags of a mountain hermit, then descended the gently sloping road flanked on both sides by a sparse forest that blocked the rays of the sun, making it perfect for a solitary stroll. 
Since the rain's inhabitants were too overwhelmed by farming and financial concerns to indulge in such leisurely strolls, I was often left to enjoy the peace and quiet of this road all by myself, occasionally scribbling a poem or two in the Japanese style. On this autumn day, however, I was brimming with excitement. You will soon realize what a fool I was. I hurried home like a boy bounding down a hill trying not to spill his basket of apples. When I arrived, I found Yuda standing in the front yard. <laughs> I finally found it! I cried to Yura in delight. The Omphalos, the navel of the world, discovered at last. A marvelous feat, wouldn't you say? Flexing her nostrils, Yura simply turned the other way and headed out back, presumably to throw away the leaves she had gathered. Her exposed white heels and clattering garden clogs nearly killed my excitement. Is it her total indifference that drives me to such vain, nugatory pursuits? I asked myself. My initial disappointment soon gave way to relief, and cooling off, I stepped in the front porch and lay down on the tatami. The temporary dwelling that Yuda and I shared was a small annex of a temple in the northeastern outskirts of Tokyo. Unlike Tokyo's other endlessly sprawling suburbs, however, this forgotten rural corner of Greater Tokyo consists only of remote backwoods, a few smelly rivers, and a small population of nosy locals whose narrow-minded temperaments are manifest in the region's topography. Here are no wide-stretching fields, no gaze-worthy mountains, such as one might find in a Chinese landscape painting, just several tired, squarish plots of land with a few houses and crooked arrangements, a small wood, and some dry fields. And wherever some part of land rises to the height of a small hill, a mighty fist appears out of the sky like the force of gravity to knock it mercilessly down. At least the famed Musashi Plain affords you the option of viewing the surrounding landscape from a kind of center point, but where can such a spot be found in these rustic parts? Here, wherever you go, you're always on the periphery. And that made finding the Omphalos, my moniker for this center spot, on this nasty belly, no easy feat. In fact, I wasn't even sure this belly had a button, but that didn't stop me. Just what prompted me to embark on this futile search, I cannot say. I have no particular affinity for nature, no abiding love for mountain streams, grass, and trees, as the old Chinese poets would say, so I can assure you it was no mere whim or escape from boredom. Truth is, I can think of nothing as boring as a romp through the wilderness, but I still pressed on, frantically traversing the changeless land like a man possessed, leaving no stone unturned, searching every corner of this cliff and wood, surveying each hilltop, and then repeating the whole process again, and all for what? For a deceptive charm that had me running in circles in its pursuit. Now I'm left with the task of explaining to myself why I ever took up this foolhardy quest in the first place, and for something that doesn't even exist to boot. But I'm still unable to come up with any rational justification. Not that I even have something to hide, mind you. I have no gimmicks, no tricks up my sleeve. And even if I did, I'd just as soon expose them from the start. Because I know that any attempt to justify my rash behavior in a bewildering hail of words will, in the end, convey nothing. Perhaps my behavior at the time was simply that of a raving lunatic, as Yura so often put it. But whether I acted like a lunatic because Yura treated me like one, or whether it was the other way around, I cannot say. At any rate, allow me to get on with the story of how I discovered my omphalos while romping around about that field that day. My discovery turned out to be a major disappointment. Having trekked that morning for over a mile to the top of the hill, I started back down along another path and, as I came upon a bend over a gentle cliff, I saw standing in the middle of the road a lone bull, his master nowhere in sight. Attempting to bypass the bull, whose bulk stretched the width of the road, I inched my way towards the cliff's edge and stopped for a moment under a fortuitously located pine tree. I inched my way towards the cliff's edge and stopped for a moment under a fortuitously located pine tree, the thick deep-rooted trunk of which protruded over the bluff where it's forked into two forming at its intersection a kind of saddle. Holding onto one of its branches, I hastened forward the farthest reach of the trunk, straddled it, twisted my torso around, and voila! I successfully had access to an unobscured, panoramic view of the region. This cliff must have been right at the corner of one of those square tied patches of land, for all I had to do was lean forward and poke my head out to see a full cross section of the entire landscape. As I gazed out over the tiered blocks that were too low for a mountain, yet too high for a valley, I began to drift among the small wood, the fields, and the ripples of houses. Now sprawled out on the tatami, I felt excitement drain from my limbs. Does the world even have a center? Why do I throw myself headlong into such pursuits. What a fool I was to think I had discovered the Omphalos. Blushing at my own behavior as of late, I felt like a boy who had just lost a tooth. Just then I suddenly felt drawn to Yura, and so, springing up, I called to her in a tender voice that was quite out of character, but Yura, pretending not to hear, despite being within earshot of the back porch, made no response. Irritation mounting, I figured she must be unaccustomed to such displays of affection, so I went out into the dirt floor porch in hope of reconciling our differences, only to find her standing there with her shoulders squared and stiff defiance. In retaliation, I picked up a nearby plate and flung it at her. Yura nimbly ducked out of the way. The plate smashed against the floor. Pulling herself up, she turned her color-drained face towards me. I see you've started up again, she sneered. <laughs> I never stopped. My lunacy will be cured only when you stop treating me like a lunatic.
You readers must be thinking that it is my pernicious habit to paint Yura in the worst possible light in order to cast myself as the good guy, but let me assure you that this image of Yura is the only image that floats to mind when I press my pen to the page. Indeed, the only way to avoid an unflattering portrayal of Yura would be to focus on her mother, that certain old woman that I mentioned in the opening line. But it's too late now to make this mother of three who lives several towns away, Anita, the heroine of my story. And yet, even as I write these lines, it is her sad face that flickers to mind now as I take a drag from my cigarette out here on the veranda. You see, I'd hoped to make the story into a kind of happily ever after fairy tale with Yura's mother as the central character. My plan was to gather up all the tawdry details about her deep class A family that had scattered into every dusty corner of this sad, floating world, and then spin the broken fragments as some enchanted fable or dreamscape novel, peering into her ghost white face, which like a no mask, bleaches out any and all emotions, I could sense beneath her tauntly stretched skin and the turbulent waves of her inner life, her daily grind, and it was precisely at such times that I would feel compelled to describe that face, which to me was as legible as one of those Omikuji fortune slips sold at temples and shrines. With her entrepreneur husband dead and his property gone, this poor old lady had been forced to abandon her life in the city and move out to this rustic era where she made ends meet by teaching classes in shamisen koto, ikebana, and the like. Her oldest child had been working in a factory in Osaka but was recently in prison for his involvement with the communists, something that pains her to this day. Her second child, Misa, had been working as a geisha in Tokyo until she settled into the neighboring towns of Isomachi where her patron, a sundries dealer, helped her open a modest little geisha house. And Yura, the youngest, was working as a barmaid in the city until she moved in with a certain deranged lunatic. But due to her innate disinclination for work and her lunatic boyfriend's meager excuse for a salary, Yura was no longer able to indulge in the pleasures of the city. Left with few options, she decided to move near her mother, citing her frail constitution and frequent colds as evidence of tuberculosis. The young lunatic lured in part by the idea of an easy, slacker lifestyle in the country, immediately consented to the move. His own chronic laziness, penury, and recurring bouts of lunacy, mostly hollering and plate smashing, however, made it unlikely that Yura would ever come upon better days, or that this fairy tale would ever reach such a felicitous conclusion. And so, as if to extricate myself from this mire, I lifted myself up from the tatami and paced around the room a few times, but soon grew weary and lay back down. Yura came nuzzling up to me and said with a coquettish grin, So now that you've found your little navel, you have nothing left to do? Why don't you go ahead and smash a few more plates? Such scenes I would sarcastically refer to as our sporadic romance, which we often found ourselves performing in as a kind of intermission to our ongoing spats. It was only at such moments that Yura would strike me as charming and innocent. Now, too, I was stirred to arousal as I blithely rested my head on her lap. You know, I really should get out and join the workforce. Loafing about like this, it just isn't gonna cut it. Now you're talking, she said, nodding in approval. It's high time you pulled yourself together. The one thing you've done since we moved out here is, well, let's see, you got yourself a dog. But the dog, a Boston Terrier imparted to me by a certain dog breeder friend, was no longer with us. Your sister, Misa, had been eyeing it for some time and had asked to borrow it during a recent visit. You two are so fickle that you're bound to get sick of it soon, she'd said. You have to give it to me before it gets too big. And with that, Misa ended up taking the puppy, promising to return it in a few days. I had named the dog Argos, after Odysseus's faithful dog in the Odyssey. This was not because I fancied myself some kind of Greek hero, <laughs> mind you. It was simply the first name that popped in my head. Yet it did later occur to me that I probably chose the name out of an unconscious desire to draw a connection between Yura and Odysseus's wife. Penelope, the paragon of virtue and chastity. Anyways, I was greatly disappointed when I later learned that despite my initial intention, Ear and I had been stroking the dog in such a way that engendered no intimacy between us, since we were dividing the dog's fur into our own respective segments, as it were. In our treatment of our dog, we were nothing like young newlyweds who deepened their bond by doting on their newborn child. Perhaps this is why I hastily handed the dog over to Misa. Lying there now on Yura's lap, I could feel my displeasure resurfacing, her well-rounded flesh turning cold. Popping up, I remarked, Well, we don't need that dog back anyway. <laughs> in this den of loafers, there's no point in putting on airs of a happy couple. The dog will be better off in Isomachi with Misa. Yura's face immediately stiffened. Taking out a postcard, I scribbled down a note to Misa saying she could keep the dog, addressed it, and handed it to Yura, instructing her to drop it off at the post office when she went out. Yura, however, promptly flung the card directly down the tatami and screeched, You expect me to run these errands for you? Since you're so eager to see her, you can deliver it yourself! Yura had no reason to be jealous of Misa, so rather than addressing her suspicions, I simply called her a silly broad. Perhaps I should have consulted with her before giving away the dog, for just then I noticed that her eyes had filled with tears and her shoulders were quivering. Gazing at her in wonder, I couldn't help but feel a strange admiration for the poor thing. After dusk, I went out to the front yard, where the doghouse stood abandoned beside the scraggly hedge of bush clover. Picking up the doghouse, I dragged it out past the main temple hall and tossed it into the bamboo grove. From there, I headed into town, stopping by the post office to wire a telegram to Misa. The telegram read like a sappy love letter, just what on earth? 
parents had prompted me to pen something so maudlin to the sister of my romantic partner remained such a mystery. Through the window, I handed it to the familiar clerk, who read it over and muttered something to himself, and turned away as he began to count the number of characters, a grin visible on his thinly mustached lip. Apparently, he too had heard the rumors regarding my lunacy. Rumors that by now made me into somewhat of a town celebrity. <laughs> The next day, I took my notebook out onto the sunlit porch. I kept the notebook for jotting down various thoughts and impressions, including those about Yura. The fact that Yura had little interest in the written word, and even less interest in my written word, saved me the trouble of having to hide the notebook from her, so I usually left it open and lying about the room. Besides, even if I had some deep, dark secret to keep from her, she was more likely to sniff it out the more I tried to conceal it. In any case, I didn't want to have to start behaving like a paranoiac merely on her account. Here's my entry about her from a week ago. Leonardo da Vinci once said, He who loves bolder things will, he himself, become bolder. How fitting that I should come across this quote right now. If there is any part of this most utterly transparent woman that remains opaque, it is those clots of blood that have formed inside of her. Blood that she, that succubus, has sucked out of me. And that blood, I want back. For even a drop of it is too precious to be wasted on that succubus. If I'm ever to amount to anything, I must first peel her off of me. But there's another maxim that says, That which is treated beautifully shall become beautiful, for even the most trivial of things are made beautiful when they are regarded and loved. The jury, of course, is still out on how well I have loved Yura, but why do such changes always seem to be laid against me by some presumptuous stranger who spouts his cockamamie theories on love while I, the man in question, a bundle of nerves, am left to ramble on confusedly my mind at sixes and sevens, grilled and hectored by da Vinci himself, capable of offering only this rejoinder. If the object of my affection is indeed vulgar, and if I, too, am being vulgarized through my contact with her, tell me then, what difference does it make whether I have yet loved Euro well or not? Has the damage not already been done? Am I not the real victim here? It is this set of questions that I find most vexing? What pretentious, self-serving rubbish? I think to myself now, tossing the journal onto the floor. If Euro got a hold of this, she would no doubt say, You took the words right out of my mouth. You think I'm vulgar? It's only because I've been corrupted by the likes of you, you conceited pig. And this would likely spiral into another dispute about which one of us is more corroded and vulgar. And being the conceited jerk that I am, I probably would refuse to even engage her in the argument, deeming her beneath me. As it turned out, however, I happened to receive a rare paycheck in the mail that morning. Yura and I, finding ourselves in relatively good spirits and looking ever the happy couple, decided to go into town for drinks. Yet the whole time we were together, I could think of nothing but how to go about ridding myself of her. You readers may think that my vacillating attitude towards Yura proves I'm an unscrupulous lecher, that I was simply using her for sexual gratification, but let me counter this claim by saying that very deep within that juicy love of flesh is the most notable spirit, and in order to touch that spirit, I first had to say, by wait, who am I fooling? There's no point in making such rationalizations, for now I see that my thoughts at the time were increasingly not my own, that some inner alterity was speaking through me, although this too rather inexplicably went unnoticed at the time. Several days later, Yura came snuggling up to me and said, I bet I can guess what you're thinking. My thoughts dwell only on you, my dear. <laughs> I doubt that. You're pining for someone else, aren't you? Having informed her of my telegram to Misa, I gathered that she was alluding to her sister, who was due to arrive at any minute. Grabbing her by the shoulders, I tried to shake a little sense into her. Now look here! If it's some twisted hobby of yours to harass me like this, you can stop it. It's indecent. They can't keep scolding you about this. Just be careful. My fortune teller always knows what you're up to. Now you try to guess what I'm thinking. Not much, I imagine. Even with a good shake, nothing spills from that empty head of yours. Perhaps if your insinuations were a bit more fleshed out, I might have a better idea of what's bothering you. <laughs> Believe me, I wish I could work myself up into a jealous fit. But whenever I try, I just feel ticklish all over and burst out laughing. We were the very picture of domestic boredom for such meaningless banter and bickering was our only means of communication, source of amusement. And so it was precisely at such times that I would be carried away on a pleasant buzz only to come crashing down as soon as she started nagging again. On this particular day, however, Misa arrived and chatting with her helped me forget the chronic weariness that had been plaguing me from head to toe. Just one carton? That dog cost me an arm and a leg. I said to her, taking a cigarette out of a carton she had bought. I know, I know. She replied, Hamamura, her brutish boyfriend, the sundries dealer, suggested we buy you something else in return. I could use a bottle of antipsychotic tranquilizers. Oh, there he goes again. Yura chimed in. Always with the crazy talk. Hey, it was your match that started this fire. I snapped back. 
Late one morning, as I lay screaming boisterously from my futon, the meddlesome lady from the liquor shop next door dropped by to take an order. Because our house was small, she quickly gathered that something was up. Through the sliding partition, I could make out her muffled conversation with Yura. Is it some sort of condition he has? Your husband? Yes, I'm afraid he's quite ill. Oh my. I could hear her say, no doubt with a look of grave concern, to Yura, who was no doubt looking on indifferently, flexing her equine nostrils. Since it was customary for temples in these parts to house mental patients, whenever you use the word ill, people immediately knew what he meant. It's no wonder everyone in town thinks you're a lunatic, Yura continued, even though there isn't a thing wrong with you. Just don't expect me to keep bailing you out. I'm sorry, miss. You see, he's not really crazy. He's just a bit eccentric. No, sir, it's shameful, I say. I'd be better off living with a real lunatic. It's your own fault, really. Misa weighed in, prancing around in your weird outfits, looking away when people greet you on the street. People in these parts are used to mental patients, so it was only a matter of time before they started to think you were one. If they're so used to lunatics, they ought to be able to tell the difference between a real one and a phony, I countered. The real lunatics around here are calm and collected. The fact that I'm so disagreeable only proves my sanity now, doesn't it? All right, already, said Yura. Enough with the crazy talk. Didn't I say I'd let you have your medicine, your liquor, if you were good? Get yourself ready. We're going into town for drinks, you lush. It was still early in the evening when Yura began to do her hair in front of the mirror as she gabbed with Misa, who had stepped out into the porch. Half-consciously, I watched the rays of sun fall between Misa's sash and waist as she turned her body in my direction. The light blue of her unlined Yuki kimono gleamed like soft down, and it wasn't hard for me to imagine the supple contours of her naked body. I soon became flustered and diverted my eyes to the mirror, only to find Yura exposed immodestly under her cheap Mei-sen kimono, her legs spread wide open to either side. Gripped by an ineffable melancholy that sent a sharp spasm through my head, I could sit there no longer. As I muttered something about having to return a borrowed item to the temple, I picked up the nearest book and scurried outside. Taking my customary route, I cut along the back of the main hall and through the bamboo grove. Now cool in the twilight air, my bony shins showing from underneath the windblown skirt of my old splashed kimono. Humming to myself a line from Singing My Cares by the third century Chinese poet Nang Zhi, I go out the gate and gaze for the fair one, but how could the fair one be here? I must have looked more suited for a visit to the head priest of some backwater temple than the presence of the fair one. Later that evening, the three of us took a train to a local seafood house. Misa borrowed a shamisen and sang a little ditty while I gazed in silent wonder at her lithe fingers gliding over the strings and at her smooth arms swirling under the cuffs of her kimono. Such a scene might have struck the casual observer as completely ordinary, and you readers will surely laugh at my smitten response. Yet living with Yura all these years had transformed me into such a boorish oaf that, for me, this elegance was a rare spectacle. You see, Yura is the kind of girl whose vulgarity and coarseness infects everyone around her. I had become like a day laborer who trudges down the road with his heavy load, totally unmindful of the wildflowers in the distance. Yet I didn't resent Yura for making me like this. She was the perfect complement to my inborn esprit ascétique, that self-denying nature of mine that had by now begun to reveal its pernicious side, threatening me with annihilation. But wait, who am I fooling? Pretentiously invoking my ascetic spirit, I now run the risk of losing all credibility, lapsing into total gibberish. After all, what moral purpose did my ascetic spirit ever serve? And to what spiritual path was I ever committed? Thinking aloud, I nearly yelped these questions over the rooftops of the town. In fact, at the time, I was no more than a fish drifting along in a semi-catatonic state, my head a bottomless sea of into which no morsel of thought could ever accumulate, let alone be refined into words. As I try nigh to amount for this sad state of affairs, all I can do is offer a series of histrionic speeches, not even worthy of a third-rate actor flailing about the stage, spouting incoherent lines that echo hollowly like pebbles cast into the abyss. Perhaps the wisest thing to do at this point would be to put on a look of humiliation and bow out at once, but it's too late even for that. I've come too far to end my story here, and so I shall try to refrain from making any more of those sophomoric diversions and elaborations and continue, without shame or reserve, my story about this aimless drifting fish who somehow managed to survive. After parting with Misa later that night, Yura and I walked home in silence through the dark, empty streets. Actually, I'm not even sure whether Yura was silent or not, or even if she was there beside me, for my mind was so in the clouds that- No, wait, in the clouds makes it sound like I were lost in some lofty thought, but I can assure you, this was not the case. Let me start over. Walking down the empty street, I suddenly stopped in the middle to take a deep breath. Standing there, I thrust out my chest and inhaled deeply. The night air flowed into my lungs like a surge of water. Even after my lungs had filled to capacity, the air continued to flow in. Had the sake gone to my head and spread rapidly throughout my body like some kind of divine revelation? How am I able to inhale so much air at once? I wondered, whereupon it dawned on me. That's it. I'm a mere void. Empty as a cavern, always have been. Filled only with emptiness, devoid of essence, hollow to the core. My skin had already started to inflate like a sad balloon at this point. By the time I realized what was happening, I was already well on my way to infinite expansion. Floating through space, I somehow managed to make it home. Finally, later that night, with Yura sleeping soundlessly beside me, I burst silently into air, dissolving into the blackness of night.
And yet all the while I was mulling over the notion of stigmata, the kind experienced by St. Francis of Assisi, whose faith in Christ was so great that the wounds of Christ appeared on his palms. The realization that I was a perfectly hollow vessel, a void filled with nothing, had now become the principal tonnet of my new faith, and I had no patience for the insolent fellow who had ascribed this faith of mine to madness or dotage or blind zealotry. What I experienced there in the middle of the street was nothing other than an ineluctable manifestation of the divine. This divine had penetrated me, made me its medium, subjected me to its will, but this emptiness was wholly unlike the purposeful emptiness expounded by the ancient Taoist philosopher Lao Zhai, who wrote in chapter 11 of Tao Jie Jing, clay is molded to make a vessel, but the utility of the vessel lies in the space where there is nothing. Rather, it was an utterly useless emptiness, a meaningless crack in the earth, a split in a tree trunk, a hollow cavity. The nothing had revealed itself to me in the form of my own emptiness, and so for me, the stigmata could only mean the immersion of my corporal shell into some void or hollow frame inscribed somewhere high in the ether. In short, it was my own eminent death that I had been mulling over, although I did not realize this at first. Little by little, the thought of self-obliteration descended upon me, lulling me into a dreamlike trance. Now, I beseech you not to taunt me with that odious word, suicide, which is an anathema for me even to write down. Not once did it occur to me to murder myself, as it were. Rather, I would somehow simply drop dead, spontaneously expire. The most crucial thing for me was that I refrained perfectly conscious of my own annihilation as it was happening. The last thing I wanted was to make an easy slide to death through, say, a pill-induced slumber. It's no way to go. Whether it was a sword ripped through my flesh or a bullet plunging into my brain, I had to verify my own end through a clear looking glass and feel it every step of the way. Lightly tapping on Yura's cranium as if to confirm its contents, I whispered softly into her slumbering ear. Oh, you poor thing. I'm not such a mean old lecher as to throw you out once I've had my fill. It's just that I've been stretched so thin that there's hardly any room for you now, but can you blame me? I'm sure you'll get on fine without me. You'll stretch your merry wings and fly along. Perhaps my tapping had grown too hard for just then Yura's eyelids parted. <laughs> What did you say? I was having the weirdest dream. Can you guess what it was? I said nothing. She continued drowsily. <gasps> Hamasam, her affectionate diminutive for Mises lover, Hamamura, had taken me to a movie theater in Asakusa or somewhere. It was just the two of us. Suddenly a man appeared on the screen. He was standing in the middle of a forest. His head was facing down and he looked as if lost in thought. Just then the camera zoomed in on his face and we looked up. Lo and behold, it was you. Hamasam cried out, get a load of that ugly mug. He's staring right down at us. Why don't you run up on him and give him a kiss? And I'm fine right here, I said. And besides, he likes being up there all by himself. He enjoys solitude. Then you stepped out of the screen and walked right up to me, glaring at me just like Conrad Veet and the man who laughs. You don't scare me, I said. What's the matter with you anyway trying to embarrass me in front of all these people? You know I only go out with Hamasan because you never take me anywhere. And when I asked you why that is, you started to beat me over the head with a broken branch you held in your hand. A silly dream, no doubt, but not without some basis in reality. I was, after all, always declining her invitations, and so she would often leave me behind to go on romps about town with that brute Hamamura, sometimes without Misa, and would invariably come home in high spirits, blathering on about this new movie or that new eel restaurant. Listening now to this run-through of her dream, I thought to myself without a trace of malice, I think I get it. Restless women like Yura are better off with a flesh and blood type like Hamamura than with a distracted loafer like me. Half in jest, I tried explaining this to her. You know, we're no good together. Next time you're in Asakusa, have that psychic take another look at you. If you tingle all over and have a salty disposition, it means your ideal companion is the wild boar. And Hamamura is nothing if not swinish. I'm sure the two of you will make a terrific couple. <laughs> Perhaps due to the sedating effect of the midnight lull, my joke did not go over as intended and Yura's expression suddenly stiffened. Is that what you've been plotting all along? To dump me onto Hamasan? Rising from the futon, Yura grabbed the glass beside the pillow and threw it against the tatami. The momentum sent the glass rebounding in the direction of the adjacent lamp, where it came precipitously close to hitting the crystal shade. I thrust out my hand to block it, but was not quick enough, and so the glass smashed against the metal stand, sending broken shards into my hand. Though there was only a minor cut, the blood started to run. Strangely, I felt no anger or resentment towards Yura. It's not that I had to suppress any feelings, it was that no emotions were being generated. Calmly rising in the eerie silence, I fetched a bottle of medicine from the cabinet and began dressing my wound, all the while brooding over my previous thought, which related neither to Yura nor the wound, but rather to my own impending death. At that moment, I must have appeared utterly empty and void of all human qualities, for Yura, Startled into a dumb silence, could only stand there, gazing at me, her irises slowly coming to a standstill. And in those eyes I caught a look of such terror it would make any man pale. Eyes that screamed at me accusingly. Lunatic! The next few days wore a semblance of tranquility. I was especially careful not to make any unnecessary sounds until I had seized my prey. Death itself. Perhaps it was due to this that my words and actions had taken on a soft mellowness. I had even become a model boyfriend to Yura. Talking about my time, I embarked on a project to rid myself of all the bad habits I had acquired over the years. First, I burned that notebook of conceited fluff. Second, I pervaded myself from dabbling in poetry, even from being moved by the shape of flowers and clouds. Third, I vowed to stop making grandiose gestures, speaking in a loud voice, using phatic interjections like busted and damn it, 
and words that convey inadvertency like accidentally and unwittingly so as to rid myself of all pathological effect. This was my new regimen, a kind of rehearsal for my imminent extinction. In short, I forswore the use of all emotive and undeliberate language in the hope of transforming my myself into a vessel so perfectly hollow that it would make no sound when struck. Perhaps some of you will laughingly say that I'm a mere epigon of Senanko Oberman, the solitary dreamer who recorded his world-weary musings in his Journal Intime while pushing a grape-laden real barrel on some farm in the French countryside. But let me assure you that that is not the case. For at the time, nothing was more nauseating to me than the bloated passages such as this one from Letter 9 of Oberman. I have held the vanities of life, and I bear within me the fiery principle of colossal passions. I bear also the consciousness of these grandeurs of social things, and I confess to the philosophical order. I have studied Marcus Aurelius without any astonishment at his maxims. I can conceive the austere virtues and even the monastery heroism. All this can animate my soul, yet feel it not. The barrow, which I heap up with the grapes and wheel at leisure, sustains it better. It seems to carry my hours peaceably, as if this slow and serviceable motion, this measured progress, were adapted to the common habit of my life. Such pretentious claptrop about rustic wheelbarrows and monastic heroism strikes me as pure affection, a cheap gimmick. And whenever I come across some sensuous lines all spit and polish, I feel as if I had bitten off a lump of bitter food and can barely keep from retching. At any rate, Yura remained oblivious as ever to what I was up to during this period, which of course was fine by me. Then on a day when I had plans to meet two friends in Tokyo, Yura and I left the house together. Not knowing when I'd be returning, I advised her to stay the night at her mother's place. As we said our goodbyes, I was seized by a strange premonition that something terrible was afoot. I reached out for an embrace, which she receive matter-of-factly, apparently taking it to be another of my sporadic displays of affection. With a deft turn of the heel, she set off towards her mother's like a ship sailing for port. What poise, I thought, watching the trailing wake of this proud little ship lithely recede into the distance. Fine figure she cuts indeed. I, on the other hand, a worthless louse, an aimless drifter, driftwood floating down the river, paralyzed by inaction, frozen by ennui, forever procrastinating, delaying the inevitable, but what, what, what if? What if I were to get it over with right now? Finish it all off, once and for all. Suddenly, everything clicked into place. I decided then and there to make this day my last on earth. After meeting up with Mr. A and Mr. B, the three of us went into town for drinks and stayed out late into the night. One of them invited me to stay at his place. I told him I had some place to be and he giddily assumed this to mean some brothel in the Red Light District. In no mood to rectify his misunderstanding, I simply muttered a few parting words and headed towards the boarding platform of my homebound train. Though the last night's train had already passed, the square in the front of the station was still humming with people, and the streets were lined with ramen, yakitori, and Odin pushcart vendors, and around which men in hunt and jackets and shorts, a, a, a typical fashion in this remote area, prowled. I entered some shady nearby tavern and ordered a beer. Not wanting to resort to alcohol to quell my nerves, I downed several glasses of water to sober up as I went over my plan. The plan was simple, to march straight along the railroad tracks and onto the oncoming locomotive, flinching neither at its sheer enormity nor at the fierce roar of its wheels. It was essential that the collision not happen in a flurry. I must calmly and collectively inch toward it. I knew the late night locomotive was due to pass by shortly. How many sleepless nights had I listened from my bed to the roar of that endless string of cargo coaches piercing the bottom of the night? I would simply stand on the steel frame railway bridge and, calculating my steps, pace back and forth as I waited for the train to come. Should the collision knock me off the bridge, I would fall right into the swollen river whose rapids are so fierce that I would have no chance of survival. And in the unlikely event that the river should spit me out into the far sea to float away in its tides, then that would be my final glory. My fate was now sealed. If tomorrow the world regarded me as just another hapless drunk who met a sudden and unexpected end, then so be it. Marking the time, I exited the bar and took a taxi halfway up the tracks. Watching the cab drive off, I headed towards the bridge and continued a space in the dim, cloud-obscured moonlight, thinking of nothing. The steel bridge suddenly emerged from the darkness, its frame coming into focus as I got closer. I could feel its sheer might expanding within me, a euphoric, pulsing sensation that dispelled all fear of death, and the soft beaming of lamplight in the railway crossing my lifted spirits even further. Stepping onto the steel bridge, I was now all legs, legs that hovered over the shining river far below and scurried from one rail to the next. Breaking into a sprint, I reached in a single breath at the middle of the bridge and stopped to sit astride one of its rails. There was nothing to do now but wait, and wait I did, for inexplicably, and here I am at a loss for words, the train failed to show. This was a turn of events I had not anticipated. Was it a miscalculation on my part, or was it some problem with the train? The train goes by every night, without exception, between 2 and 2.30, yet the needle of my moonlit watch was already nearing the 3 o'clock mark. Nearly an hour had passed since I'd stepped onto this bridge. Dumbfounded and helpless, I continued to gaze down through the darkness at the river flowing below. Then an idea occurred to me. 
That's it. I'll drown myself in the river. There's a hazardous area just up the way called the Devil's Abyss, where the current is so strong that a lousy swimmer like me could never make it out alive. But in the end, for whatever reason, I, I didn't jump. Although fear had begun to set in, that was not what was keeping me from jumping. What mattered to me most was not whether I felt fear, indeed I prefer to die in fear, but that I met my death with my head held high. Springing up, I made several steps when suddenly I found myself sprinting away from the train tracks, slowing down only once I had passed the last girder and reached the opposite riverbank. Gliding down the sloping bank, which felt more like tatami, I suddenly lost my footing and tumbled down the smooth belly of the bank to the water's edge, landing in a thick, putrid patch of weeds and clumpy grass. No sooner had the swampy water penetrated my shoes than my face was assailed by a horde of horseflies, mosquitoes, and gnats. From this filthy mire I rose and, like a dog, shook myself off, my skin tingling and crawling all over. The stoic composure I had hitherto who maintained was now utterly lost. Leaping to the river at this point would amount to no more than a frenzied act of desperation, so I had no choice but to scramble back up the bank. My entire body was now aflame, and hot beads of sweat spurred from my pores, goaded on by the mounting chaos and confusion. I plunged headlong to the darkness. My clothes were muddied and torn, and I hadn't the slightest clue whether I was running through bush, field, or ditch. My panting breath and heaving heart echoed deeply in the silent night. Severed from all language, all thought, I was now a wild beast. How long had I laid there under that beat-up fence before coming to? The numbness in my souls had now seized every extremity of my body, and my eyeballs stung as if ablaze. Looking up, I saw hovering above me a small white mass that grew clearer as my pupils focused. It was a white hibiscus superimposed over the whiteness of the dawning sky. A string of words promptly issued from my mouth, almost imperceptibly, and the realization of what I had said felt like a sharp pinprick. Leaping to my feet, I began to stomp about in a frenzy, seemingly with a strength not my own, for the string of words had come in the form of a sentious haiku. I was blindsided, double-crossed, by this sudden resurgence of a mode of speech which, despite all my efforts of suppression, had slipped from my lips like a long, bottled-up sigh. For the record, I will transcribe this trite haiku, which makes me recoil in shame whenever I think about it. Arukuichiya, fuyo no hana ni shiromikeri, sauntering night on a hibiscus flower, the whitening dawn. I was speechless beyond mortification. What had come over me? This was no less than an act of treason. That I should conjure up such a trite haiku on this night, a night that was supposed to have irrevocably sealed my fate. Now utterly exhausted, I fell to the ground with a thud and, like some dumb broad, lay there baffled and dazed, staring blankly into space. When I finally came to, the sky was considerably brighter, though it seemed to me I had been asleep for no more than a few minutes. Still out of sorts, I got up and walked about aimlessly until at last I came upon a familiar path. On one side of the path were dry fields. On the other side, a narrow fenced road stretching whitely into the brisk dawn. At the end of the road was a forest of pine trees. Beyond that, a line of houses, the first of which was Misa's. As I made my way down the path, I was suddenly struck by the urge to see Misa. Before I knew it, I was headed in the direction of her place. It did not even occur to me how odd it would be to show up at this hour and looking like I did. But at this point, I was no longer steward of my own body. I had little to say over where it would lead. Finding the front entrance to her house locked, I thought I'd follow the low tea tree fence around her the back door, which was always left partially unlocked, and gently slide my hand through the slot and unlatch the chain. But just as I tiptoed through the door, I heard a rattling of shutters, followed by the voice of a boisterous woman, and that of a jolly debaucher, and finally the yelping of a dog struggling to come out, out into the porch. I instinctively crouched down and crawled under the fence to peep in on the scene. I shall now describe, without embellishment or adornment, exactly what I saw. First to appear was Hamamura, whose one clogged foot dangled over the veranda, his thick hairy shins jutting from his ill-fitting terry cloth robe. Next was Argos, his front leg stretched over Hamamura's knee, his tail wagging. And behind Hamamura was Yura, who sat sideways as she nestled up to his rotund body. Over her flashy yukata, she wore an undersash and a rough-lined howdy. Indeed, this was a Yura far more more seductive and supple than any I had ever seen. Just how I managed to make my way out of there without being discovered, I'm not sure, but once I was a safe distance from that place, I broke into a mad dash. What I was feeling as I ran was neither anger nor shame nor anguish nor anything of the sort. I was, in fact, rather calm, if a tad bewildered. Bewildered mostly by the thought of seeing their bewildered faces should they have discovered me. How humiliating it would have been to see their mouths drop at the sight of me crouched there, filthy, on the verge of collapse, vainly trying to shoo away Argos, who had sniffed me out. After stumbling through forest and field, I finally reached my place. Prying open the back door, I stepped inside, slammed the door shut, and collapsed with a thud. Lying there, supine amidst total darkness, I was seconds away from falling into a coma. In those few fleeting seconds, though, my mind seemed to be feverishly pursuing something, as if trying to ascertain the subject of its own thoughts. It felt as though some foreign entity had lodged itself somewhere in my brain. But this nebulous entity remained tucked away in the folds of my brain and was not to be dislodged by a few tired pulls. I let the thought slip away. You may think my humiliating discovery had suddenly transformed me into a fully new man, some hopeful chap who, Absabara loca, heaven of radiant light, was now ready to crawl his way back into the world of life and its myriad earthly delights. But truth be told, never had I so thoroughly lost my desire to live or been so overcome by the feeling that life was empty and meaningless, a tiny speck in a vast sea. The more spiteful among you will insist that this feeling of emptiness is rooted in my overzealous attachment to life, my unreflecting devotion to this world. But by this point, such speculations were the farthest thing from my mind, and I had already drifted softly into sleep. What the? What on? 
As if lifted from the bottom of a well by a rope, I was lured back into consciousness, my Misa's words, which gradually became discernible. I opened my eyes to find myself being gathered into her arms, our faces nearly touching. The sun rays flooding the room through the door were blinding. What in the world happened to you? You look like you fell in a ditch. Now you know why you shouldn't drink so much. You're not hurt, are you? That she assumed my condition was the result of a night of excessive drinking spared me the trouble of having to explain what had happened. For some reason, it seemed perfectly natural to me that Misa should be at my place, and it never even occurred to me to ask what she was doing here. Unable to speak, let alone move, I finally managed to grunt. <sighs> fix me something. I'm starving. As if this was some magical incantation, my stomach suddenly began to convulse, sending a faint sound up my esophagus. Unable to endure pangs of hunger, I implored her to hurry. Feed me first. I'll listen to what you have to say afterward. Now you're gonna have to settle down. Rushing me like this isn't gonna get you your meal any sooner. She went into the kitchen and began rattling the cupboard. <sighs> Nothing here. Can you wait for me to boil you some rice? No, no, that won't do. All right, all right, I'll get you something. The bakery's a bit far though, so you'll have to make do with something from that takeout sushi shop. Just keep yourself together until I get back. Finding myself alone, I put my hand on my forehead to check for a fever, but all I could feel was a deep throbbing in my arteries. Aside from the hot flashes brought on by fatigue, there seemed to be no sign of fever. This isn't going to make much of a story unless I run a fever, lapse into delirium, and go wild on Misa when she gets back. I thought, only to be immediately taken aback at my own nerve. Was it really me thinking such sordid thoughts, or was someone else doing the thinking for me? Sitting stiffly there at the table with chin in hand, I felt myself starting to resemble some sort of fiend. I glanced nervously around the room, thinking there might be some baleful spirit trying to take possession of my soul. Just then, an apparition of Yura's face stole past me in midair, though to my great annoyance had vanished before I could take a swipe at it. I felt an insuppressible rage well up inside me, yet by now I was so Delirious, so faint from hunger, so incapable of thought altogether, that I decided it would be best to make peace with Yura and proceed as if nothing had happened. I resumed my prior posture and squared my elbows smugly on the table. Misa eventually returned with a package bundle of sushi and a kettle, presumably borrowed from the temple. I'm back. Here's your food. Wiping the globs of mud from my fingers, I glumly began picking away at the cheap sushi rolls she had laid down on the table. Misa cracked a smile as she brewed a kettle of tea beside me. You're usually neat as a pen, and now look at you. Your hands are as black as coal in that mug. There's dirt all the way up to the tip of your nose. Just what were you up to last night, anyway? She whipped out a pocket mirror from her sash and thrust it up to my face. Buzz off. Now, now, no need for you to get into a state. Come on, I'll fix you a bath. Can't stand to look at you like this. Getting that filth off of you is going to take more than a quick scrub. You're quite a nuisance, you know that? She had evidently called on the sexton for help, but I could hear someone's voice over the ring of the well bucket. Our bath, if you could call it that, was really just a small outdoor wooden iron roof tub that would fill with leaves on windy days. I could now make out the roar of the bath fire. Misa, fanning herself about the collar with her cloth, returned to the room and casually plopped herself down at the tea table. My, last night was hectic, she began as if to continue a previous conversation. Hamamura had just arrived and was on his first drink when Yura showed up. She said you'd gone into town for the night. Hamamura was in fine spirits, and Yura too had already had quite a bit to drink. I tell you, she sure can drink with the best of them. So then she tells me I should go to Nita to check on Mother, who's bedridden with the cold. Hamamura liked the idea too. Oh, go on, he said. You're not wanted here. I'll stay behind and take care of little Miss Yura. How about it? You can trust me. I ain't that bad. He says, so I agreed to go check on Mother, saying I'd be right back. But by the time I got to Mother's, her temperature had risen, so I had to call the doctor and buy her ice. When that was finished, well, the night was over. That Yura had spent the night with Hamamura did not come as a total shock, and it was even less surprising that Hamamura should be the center of such a scandal. Still, I was far from fine with all of this. A moment ago, I said I was unable to make out Yura's face. Now, however, the two disheveled figures I'd seen earlier that morning began to flicker vindictively before my eyes. Yura's clinging odor, which had over time permeated my body, began to oppress me, enshrouding me in an indefiable, unshakable gloom. Misa provided no comfort, and she seemed somehow unperturbed by what had gone on the previous night. All I could do now was sit and sulk in this murky gloom of mine, better known by its proper name, jealousy. Now what's the matter? Misa asked. You're sulking again. Are you going to finish your food? You know, you really had me worried there. I drop by thinking you might be home, and what do I see but the gate flung wide open? I honestly thought there was a robber in the house. When I peeped inside, terrified, there you are all covered in mud and passed out in the dim light. My heart literally skipped a beat. Oh, yes, the bath. It should be ready now. Go on and get in. Then you can fill me in on what went on last night. While Misa tested the water, I removed my clothes I had been wearing since the previous night, threw a kimono over myself, and proceeded to the back of the house, where Misa sat stirring the bath water with a small bucket. It's a bit tepid, but get in. I'll kindle the fire. I removed my kimono, hung it on a low branch of the fig tree beside the lean-to entrance, and submerged myself in the warming water. Misa crouched down beside the bucket and began stoking the fire, averting her smarting eyes. Reclining against the room of the tub, I gazed down at the sway of her fragrant hair, the marked whiteness of her exposed hairline, 
the slight shake of her shoulders, her springy thighs. Only air separates my naked self from her supple, writhing body. I noted, whereupon I was immediately shaken by a powerful impulse that, to put it bluntly, was none other than unbridled lust. Had I been of brawny build, I would have proudly exhibited my stout limbs and ravished her right there on the spot. But as the thought of my puny body fills me only with shame, I instead remained shriveled inside the tub, my eyes madly glowing with desire as I choked on the powerful scent emitting from her body. That's enough, I groaned. Right, she replied casually, enveloped in steam. Fanning the fire once more, she made her way out. Springing from the tub, I quickly dried myself off, pushed open the door, grabbed my kimono from the branch, and chased her down past the fig tree. By the time she noticed my encroaching footsteps and turned around, it was already too late for her to get away. What? Misa stood there frozen, unable to even register surprise, and immediately surrendered to my forceful embrace. Just then her eyelids appeared to flutter ever so slightly, but this seemed not an expression of resignation or melancholy or any such inner emotion, but rather a reaction to the slight wind having lashed her eyes as she stood there in the clear autumn air. It seemed Seems my pen has come to a halt. Had I any desire to turn this little recit into a full-fledged novel, I see no reason why I couldn't pull it off. How hard could it be to add a little embellishment here and there? And haven't my recent adventures provided me with plenty of stimulating and gripping raw material? Then again, any hope of writing a proper novel was lost the moment I pressed my pen to the page. Otherwise, that novel I had intended to write, the one about the woman, which I alluded to in the opening lines, would be finished by now. Many of you will no doubt laugh at my feeble effort, wondering if this silly portrait is all I can muster. But I say this, in order to go on writing, I first had to get this out of my system. This was my necessary starting point, the proverbial cork that had to be pulled to get the sake stored in the barrel. And though it just so happens that my barrel swishes with nothing but lurid stories of this wretched world, if I ever catch myself leisurely paring my fingernails after having traced, in the stolid manner of the so-called naturalist, onto a thin sheet of paper the smut of this world, then I would no sooner snap my pen in half and join the local drunks in a round of rod gut. My aim, you see, is to elevate all this ugliness to the realm of the strange, the fantastic. You may wonder, then, why I was unable to accomplish that here. The reason is that, well, certain circumstances have, and this is most difficult for me to admit, especially after this flamboyant rant, rendered the task impossible. Though it pains me to discuss this with you, and by you, of course, I mean not the average reader, but rather you esteemed individuals who have patiently and carefully followed me up to this point, let me try to explain. You see, for some time now, I have suffered from that febrile disease known, as, known to the ancients as nymphalepsy. As my condition shows no sign of abating, everything I write runs the risk of sounding like an eclogue sung by the goat god Pan, the mere mention of whom makes me blush with shame. But now that I have so thoroughly unburdened myself, there is nothing left for me to write, and so I shall abruptly terminate my little receipt here in media res, as I see no other way of wrapping it up. That it had to come to this is largely the fault of my unsteady feet, which had me prancing around in frantic pursuit of one thing after the next, preventing me, until now, from recognizing this goat god that dwells inside of me. Now, if I could just regain my composure, renew my spirits, and subdue this lewd fiend, perhaps then my pen will churn out something that might withstand your criticism, my dear readers. Or is that just another one of my conceited fantasies? Okay, Nicole, thank you for the wonderful reading, as always, as I was teaching my other class in my other um, next door in the classroom. Um, this was, again, uh, Kajin by Ishika Jun, uh, translated by me, his debut work from 1935. And um, we will go over all the questions on the study guide and its relationship to the other essay, uh, Edo Jin no Hase Ho Nitsuite, the thought patterns of the people of Edo and its relation to this and other early works of fiction. In class, I will see you all then. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. forth onto the pages as if the tip of my pen was were, were oh my god and blown away by <gasps> oh my god oh my god no my nail never buy on Shein I'm taking a break this is too much leaving no stern unturned stern no paint Yura in the worst possible light in order to cast myself as a goodbye you readers must be thinking that it is my pernicious habit to paint Yura in the worst hob- Hobbit? Why did I say Hobbit? Mm, how is spirit acet ascetique? Espir spirit acet- Hold on. Esprit ascetique. Ding along in a semi cat 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 Epigon. Epigon. Abhas Baraloka. I'm going to say it like a Brazilian. It's sounding like an e eclogy. Eclog. 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 Eggnog. <laughs>